Welcome everyone to another Legal Tech Talk session. My name is Francis Anderson. I'm the MD of NetLaw Media. And um, today it's a true pleasure to have you all with us. And I'm delighted to confirm that we have representation from over 45 countries joining us today. So I am absolutely delighted to introduce this session, which are, is our first in our Global Legal Tech Talk series. Um, and it's a truly insightful session with a formidable panel from the legal community on leading digital disruption in the agile world, which is supported today by the Australian Society for Computers and Law. And it will be chaired by Professor Richard Siskin, who will outline more on this session shortly. Now, before I go through the housekeeping, let me start by doing a short, um, since I can talk quite a lot about Richard, um, by introducing our chair. So he's an author, he's a speaker and an independent advisor to international uh, professional firms, general counsel, judiciaries and national governments. His main area of expertise is the future of legal service with particular reference to the impact of information technology. He has specialized in legal technology since the early 1980s and his views have influenced a generation of lawyers and legal technologists around the world. Richard is the president of, of the Society for Computers and Law and since 1998, he has been the IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. Now, before I hand over to our steam chair and our guests of today's round table, as we're live, I encourage all of you listening today to ask questions, join us. Um, you know, we'd love to hear your views. So click on your name in the participants um, and raise your hand. And what I will do is I will raise you, I will not raise you, I will draw you in and into the conversation sort of nearer to the end. So you can ask your panel, to, uh, your question to uh, Richard or our additional panel members. Or alternatively, um, if you don't want to do that, put your question through the Q&A function. Again, we'll be monitoring that and then we'll draw them in live um, and our panel will sort of engage with you as well if we can't get to your questions. Or alternatively, put it through the chat, but um, we are delighted to have you all with us. So without further ado, um, Richard, I'm going to pass it over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis. Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Siskind. I'm sitting here in England, and it's a delight to be with you. And thank you, Francis, incidentally, for assembling such a, a great team. The format, what we thought we'd do today, is really try and answer two questions. Uh, the first question is, what's all the fuss in why, why is legal technology of strategic significance? Why is it important? And we want to hear each individual panelist's perspective on this. And secondly, how can we accelerate its uptake on the assumption we think acceleration is a good thing? And what Frances has done is she's brought together uh, Anna from the GC community, Stuart from the Big Four, Michelle who's an innovation leader, Gilbert from a more traditional firm, James from what we might call a law company. So each in different ways interested in technology. And our aim in this I suspect very short hour, is just to get a sense of these different perspectives. Fascinating for me because I've spent my life in legal technology that now there's so much interest. Uh, now, what I thought we would do is we'd allow the speakers, the panelists themselves to introduce themselves in the course of asking the first question. So far less for me, far more for them. I wonder if I could ask Anna to take the stage in the first instance, say a little about yourself, but above all else, answer the question, of why is all of this important? What's the fuss about legal technology? What's its strategic significance? Thanks, Richard, and hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lazinski. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. I started my legal career in a major Australian law firm before spending the last many years uh, in-house working across various industries and for various multinationals. I'm a former executive general counsel turned change agent, advisor and influencer. And to answer your question, Richard, um, I'm going to quote a meme and the meme goes like this. I've got 99 problems and technology will solve 86 of them. And in my experience of leading an award-winning in-house legal department, that rings very true. Technology is of strategic significance because it is a powerful enabler for any legal team across so many fronts. And I'm just gonna call out three in the interests of time. The first is, is that technology enables scale, value and reach. We've come from a place post GFC of more for less to a COVID era of simply more. More workload, more speed, more efficiency, more agility and dexterity, 
more regulation and governance, more value, more data analytics, more transparency, more standardization and automation, more business mindedness and business partnership, more legal operational thinking. You get the gist, more is more. Secondly, technology enables relevance and resonance. In this decade, businesses and governments across Asia are prioritizing innovation and AI initiatives like never before. To that end, business stakeholders will choose a lawyer that possesses what I call IQ 2.0, innovation intelligence. A lawyer that's acting in a client's best interest, congruent with the digital age, not just doing things the way that they've always been done. Lastly, technology enables us to work smarter, not harder. It creates much needed space for lawyers to focus less on the dull and more on the dirty and dangerous. It creates a culture of continuous improvement, learning new skills, and a level of sophistication, sustainability, and access in support of and in alignment with business pressures and objectives. Back to you, Richard. Fantastic. From dull to dirty and dangerous, that sounds uh, 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 the, the spirit of the day. Michelle, I wondered if you could build on this, or you can contradict it if you wish, but you spend so much of your time thinking about innovation. What's your perspective on this? Uh, thanks, Richard, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Innovation and Digital Transformation at Kingwood Malsons. I, too, are based in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and I've probably spent most of my career trying to convince lawyers and business professionals to use technology, so I probably have a bit of a bias here around uh, I think it's just hugely enabling, and I agree with many of Anna's points. I think a couple perhaps to pick up on that I think it also brings through, and I think specifically now in particular, uh, is this um, ease of use. But when I mean ease of use, I mean the actual activities around it. I think a lot of the activities we do are repeat. Um, they are labour intensive. They're not great fun to do by any stretch of the imagination. And I think we can really liberate people out of that. And I think a lot has been said about the hours our people work and around the value of that. And I think you can certainly use technology to break the back of some of that. I think the other piece that it really enables and why it's so strategically relevant is around collaboration. Uh, and around things that um, it allows us to actually be on the same page, I think, which reduces a huge amount of friction for both us and the buyers. Uh, I think it allows us to drive quickly to the right problems, whether that be a shared to-do list with CP checklists on big deals, whether it be collaborative drafting, whether it be you know, a shared document. So, you know, there's really good simple examples to demystify there that you know, really do drive at the heart of it. Uh, but I think the most exciting thing for me and why I think it's really significant is I think it can change service delivery. I think it can create new value and it can often encapsulate that value and deliver it. And that should hopefully affect your business model and it can actually deliver ultimately great business outcomes. That's great. Yeah, I, I'm very much with that. I, I think we're the first 60 years of legal technology, in my view, were about automation, computerizing our old ways of working. I think what you're suggesting there is that technology can enable us to deliver services in ways that weren't possible in the past, and to some extent, but uh, I still think a limited extent, we've seen that through the COVID period. Stuart, uh, you work within uh, a huge organization and the kind of technological advance we've seen in audit and tax are a good few years ahead, but I'm interested in your perspective. Yeah, thanks Richard. And it's great to be here with everybody. So uh, my name's Stuart Fuller. I'm the Global Head of Legal Services at KPMG. Uh, I was lucky for the first 27 years of my career, I was lucky enough to work with Michelle Marnie at a big law firm. So I've sort of seen big law to big four uh, and look, I think uh, what Anna and Michelle have said, Richard, I agree with. Uh, I think it's important because clients are directing us there and driving us there. So the way we look at it these days is uh, being a global organisation. So we provide legal services across 81 jurisdictions. Um, if we want to actually service our clients globally, you just can't do that by having people anymore. You need to have a service around it and a technology enabled part of that service. So clients are actually driving us towards legal technology and using that as part of the solution. Because if a solution is simply throwing more humans at it these days, that's actually not a solution at all. It's just, um, it's just old practice. Uh, I think the second thing is, um, you know, it, we're shifting into this. It's, it actually augments, not replaces. So I, I have no time for the argument that technology is going to do away with jobs. It's going to improve our lives. And I think Anna and Michelle have already reflected on that. This concept that it augments 
employers, uh, not replaces them, I think is fundamental around the strategic significance because it allows lawyers to do what they do best, which is solve complex problems, deal with people and bring judgment and insight and gets you a little out of that process. Uh, and part of that is the speed, accuracy, freedom piece, but it's also just focusing on, on what lawyers do best rather than other things. Uh, and then I think it also um, unlocks data. So you, you're right, the audit and the tax business in KPMG has, has created a natural uh, level of comfort, even for the 2,800 lawyers we have around technology, Richard, because it's so embedded in other solutions we give. But the data that you collect from using technology and then provide back to clients actually unlocks value for their business. As Michelle said, changes the business model. I think for the provider, it actually changes the business model for the client because it starts to give them back some valuable insights into their own business that they may not have otherwise got. Uh, and then lastly, I think it's just the range of things. So, if it's, you know, we'll probably move beyond saying legal tech and just say tech quite soon, but whether that's a business intelligence tool that helps a client make a decision through to an AI tool to do due diligence, through to contract lifecycle management, through to access to justice tools, uh, the range of this is now pervasive. So the strategic part is it's embedded in our solutions and it's embedded in our, in our work. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And, and you raise, and perhaps we can discuss the issue of the extent to which AI it will augment or take on some of the tasks of current lords. Perhaps we can pick that up in a few minutes. Meanwhile, over to James. James, uh, do, do you regard yourself as part of what some people call a law company? Is that how you would define yourself? Uh, I remember sitting around our executive uh, leadership team about four years ago when we were cooking up what we were going to call our sector and um, somebody mentioned Law Company and I actually thought it didn't sound good at all, um, but uh, democracy reigned and, and so we started pumping out Law Company. So the short answer is, is, is yes. And I remember the I remember the day that we made it up, um, so it's it's pleasing to see some traction. So, um, I uh, I look after Elevate's business in Asia Pacific. We are um, one of the world's leading law companies, a provider of uh, business of law services rather than legal advice. We work with uh, law firms and corporate legal departments, um, and, and that is it. We we exist to. Um, uh, uh, help develop the legal sector and um, help the legal sector counter um, the challenges that we're, we're facing. So the way I, uh, the way I look at this, and I'm in Sydney, uh, incidentally, um, the way I, I sort of reflected on this as I was preparing was that um, whilst we work with law firms and legal departments, this really is driven by clients and, and behind them, their businesses, which uh, the legal departments are serving. And those businesses have been transformed by technology 20, 20 years ago. Um, and the legal departments, many legal departments, um, just, just simply didn't keep up. And there was this lag of, um, of, of continuing to operate in a, in a, in a you know, a, a more siloed fashion and a more artisanal fashion. And um, obviously you can't make generalizations. There are some fabulously advanced um, legal departments out there. But, um, you know, with, with the, the pace of business, it became increasingly um, overwhelming to, for, for legal departments to sort of just keep up with, with their internal stakeholders. And the first wave of legal tech that, that you know, we saw was really um, focused on improving the life of the lawyer, making the individual lawyer more efficient and more effective e-discovery tools and you know, contract abstraction tools, things like that. Um, but as um, you know, re the regulatory environment uh, uh, sort of continues to strengthen and, and law is moving more into the core um, of uh, each of these companies' businesses and becoming um, more and more tightly integrated with helping those companies to deliver on their core deliverables, whatever widget they, they happen to be producing. And with that comes a, a tremendous um, strain on, on the legal departments to keep pace, to keep in integrated um, and to handle um, a flow of data um, which bounces not only between the business and the, le and, and the legal department, but uh, out to law firms and to the broader um, legal ecosystem. So, um, you know, why is legal tech strategic? Um, I, I think it's an imperative uh, as, as much as being strategic. Uh, legal departments and, and the law firms that serve them must um, continue to embrace technology simply to um, continue doing their, their jobs. Many thanks, James. And finally, uh, in this first run around the track, as it were, Gilbert, um, you are in a more, if I may put it this way, more traditional large international firm. Let's hear what it's like where you're sitting, which is in Singapore. 
Yeah. Hi, I'm Gilbert. Um, one of the partners at Denton's Road Dyke in Singapore, and uh, I'm an IT lawyer. But uh, within the firm, I function as the IT resource partner, a CIO of sorts. And, you know, hearing all the other speakers speak, um, they, they present to us the, the problem as a practitioner that we face every day, as a partner in the firm we face every day. The clients want more, more accuracy, more speed, more everything, but they want less cost. Right. So that that really is the mantra. And I think that, you know, in, uh, everywhere where we look, you know, costs are rising. And I think that is implementation of technology. And to this point, I, sh I, I share Stuart's view. I think we should drop the word legal out of tech and just leave it as tech. And I think that we really need to adopt more tech because we need to A, manage costs, B, manage the complexity of practice because our clients are asking us to react to situations more quickly, thereby raising our risk profile as well because we need to be accurate. We need to give concise and the correct advice. But with the amount of data that's coming, with the amount of analysis that it takes, and, you know, the, um, and with the sophistications, of course, these days, reaching out to non-traditional jurisdictions to look at the case law history there or the developments of law in other parts, you need to have access to all this information and yet you need to process it quickly, precisely and apply it to your client's particular situation. And, you know, we now find ourselves also in a situation where we need to give business insights and share information. And you can't really do that if you were to just sit in your own little pond and don't look beyond and to look beyond, you need to deploy technology, whether it's communications technology, whether it's um, technology that helps you see file information or technology that helps you share information, right? Now, um, Anders has actually asked a very interesting question on the chat. Um, uh, and it says that, you know, uh, lawyers would want to use technology, but, you know, they don't want to do anything about it because they cannot make a decision. I can tell you that from our uh, technology journey over the last 20, 25 years, it actually takes just one or two partners in the firm to really spread the message. You need one or two believers in the firm. You need them to be loud enough. And you need the other partners to take a leap of faith and not look at ROI all the time, right? Because the ROI will come. And even if you don't see it in real dollars and cents, I think you need to convince your partners that the ROI is not having to worry about risk, being able to sleep better at night um, and uh, delivering really top quality work uh, to your clients in this very fast paced, technologically enabled age. Thank you for that. I think we're in grave danger of in being uh, a violent uh, agreement with one another around this table. Uh, so we'll have to try and uh, create some controversy if we can uh, uh, perhaps uh, debate with one another a, a little more. I, I think what's emerging, of course, is that technology is of use both internally to law firms and, and, and vitally in the deliver of our services to clients. Always strikes me the term disruptive technology is a very provider-oriented term uh, because from the client's point of view, if the technology brings, for example, uh, lower cost, speedier service, more, uh, more convenient service, then that's hardly disruptive. It may well be disruptive for the provider, but in a way from the market's point of view, that's of less significance. I, I thought in the interest of trying to perhaps uh, raise a little bit of controversy, we could pick up on Stuart's point, which was about artificial intelligence. And he set out to stall very clearly, which was saying that he had, if I recall correctly, little time for those who said that the technology is going to replace lawyers. It's more about augmenting lawyers. Um, now, I, I, uh, I wrote my doctorate in AI and law at Oxford in the 80s, so I've spent my life uh, being unsure about AI and law. Uh, I, I'm sure it's got massive potential, but I generally say most of the short-term predictions are hugely overstating its impact. But nonetheless, I think most of the longer-term predictions are probably understating its impact. But I'd be interested, perhaps Michelle, because you you live and breathe innovation and change and so forth. What's your perspective on the impact of AI and legal practice? I think it's a marathon, not a sprint. I, I, I agree. I think it's augmentation. Uh, and I think that there is a, quite a significant uh, maturation around machine learning. It has improved and certainly is improving. Uh, but supervised machine learning needs just that. It needs large data sets. It needs to be curated. The people that are doing the, the supervision need to make the right calls so the training data gets better and better. Uh, and so it is, it is one of those things over time that will improve. Um, I think what is actually more interesting in some ways on AI is probably 
I know if there's a question from uh, smaller law firms, people like Microsoft and your 365 stack is really interesting because they've embedded AI into Q&A Maker as an example where you can ask legal questions, uh, you can get answers, you can actually start doing some of that virtual legal assistant piece no matter what your size is because it's a standard offering within the Microsoft app. So I do think AI is pervasive. I do think it's moving into not just legal tech, but tech. I think we're certainly seeing it coming through there. And I too think it will augment. I think to your point, Richard, it can't do the complex reasoning. I'm yet to see it doing those bespoke requirements, but the things that are pattern matching and really to your point, those repeat behaviors, I think it is quite good at. The great unanswered question in all of this though, is that is the speed with which it's going to develop because if you believe, as I believe, that we're in an era of increasingly capable machines, it's not clear how quickly the, uh, systems will unfold and develop. But looking as I do at other professions, uh, for instance, medical diagnostics, these systems are doing things now that just a few years ago, doctors were saying were impossible, if not mm. unimaginable. Uh, I'd just like to keep a, an open mind. James, I think you had your hand up and then maybe you thought better of it, but uh, feel yeah, your hands up again. Let's hear from you. There it is. Uh, yeah, so um, we uh, we bought a company a couple of years ago called Lex Predicts, Dan Katz's company that uh, was one of the leading thinkers of development of AI technology in the law. Um, and really my AI journey sort of started there, sort of listening to Dan and, and getting under the hood of, of the AI that he had written. Um, what I would say is um, many law firms and corporate legal departments that we work with um, do not properly yet leverage the most basic of um, dumb technologies, i.e. not artificially intelligent technologies. And, and yet I see conferences and white papers and discussions and indeed this conversation the gravitating almost like a moth to a flame talking about AI. And indeed it has its benefits. But um, most organizations can move a tremendous distance from where they are just um, deploying really good standard technology, configuring it properly and, and driving adoption. Then you, um, you know, you, you, you sort of gain the right to sort of play with these more advanced tools, which are not as advanced as, as, me, as many people believe. Um, but that's, that's one point I would make is, um, don't be too, too enamored by AI. There's many, many tools out there that are excellent that don't have AI that can move you an awful long way. Yeah. I would say in response to that, though, that if you are, as there are now thousands, uh, a tech startup in the legal area, you might only be de devoting yourself to AI. So what's going to be interesting is, to, is whether or not, and again, it might be as yet uninvented technologies or as yet... Uh, unrecognized solutions. Uh, what fascinates me is whether or not, whether or not it's from AI, but whether, whether or not one of these smaller businesses, very focused in particular enabling technologies, might actually drive some remarkable changes. James has to be right. Of course, there's huge amounts more that most lawyers in-house and in law firms could do with basic technology, but we've got to keep an eye in the longer term. What I'm going to do is now ask Gilbert very quickly to respond. And then, Stuart, maybe, because uh, you're going to ask the answer the first you would the first to answer the second question. So maybe you can uh, integrate that um, with what you were about yeah. to say. But Gilbert, uh, take us home on this particular question. No, I think, you know, James is absolutely right. I mean, the thing is that a lot of people are looking at AI, but I think the question that law firms really need to ask themselves is AI for what purpose? So, you know, there's a... Um, um, there's a, a question I think uh, Marina is asking about, you know, uh, what technology is emerging to automate decision making? I mean, are we, you know, as lawyers going to use AI to make decisions or are we using it to search for information in order to make the advice or give the advice to our clients or in the practice of law? I mean, it's a very beguiling um, kind of thing, AI, right? I sit on the law reform subcommittee on AI and robotics in Singapore. And we looked at this issue. There are risk elements involved, particularly if using it for decision making. Um, we could use it as a predictive model to see what the outcome of a case might be, but only if there is the underlying data set available in your country, because the data set for one country is not necessarily applicable you know, um, in yet a, a, another country. So I think a little bit of um, hope to look at AI, if you're thinking of leapfrogging, 
current technology and you haven't spent any money on it yet, you're the leapfrog and you go into AI, that's possible. But I think one needs to exercise some caution in there. And also remember that the practice of law um, is a human kind of practice. We are a service organization and we cannot dissociate, dissociate that uh, from the value that we give to our clients by employing a fully AI enabled solution. Well, thank you very much, Gilbert. There's so much there. Um, uh, and of course, it is the case today that uh, the delivery of legal service is very human based. Uh, but if it were the case that systems could deliver a reliable outcome for clients that was cheaper, better, quicker, more convenient, we can't always assume that they will say we prefer the human version. And again, we're seeing this across so many other professions. So that's the debate we could have, but we have got to move on to the second question. And Stuart, as I say, you can perhaps weave your, your last comment on AI into this. But given there is... Um, around the table and I think around the world, uh, growing enthusiasm for legal technology and recognition of how important it might be. How as, as a, we, we've gathered together a group of people who are thought leaders and, and, and market leaders, how can we be involved in accelerating the uptake of technology? Stuart, yep. can you give us your first thoughts yes. on that? Yeah, of course. Great, great question, Richard. Um, look, I, I think, you know, a couple, couple of quite simple things. Um, I think demystifying what it is. So, you know, coming back to AI, you know, you have to always have a use case, I think, not talk in terms of the broad AI. So AI, I think, can scare people because they do get to that point of thinking there'll be robots giving advice. In fact, AI, as Michelle said, you need lawyers to train it, and then it simplifies sometimes just the first and second stages of tasks. We, we use it for contract repapering massively powerful machine called Ignite. It's only as good as you train it, and it then does the first 30 or 40% that then frees up the lawyers to do the rest. So I think you've always got to look at this in use cases. But I think that the times come back to the question, Richard, like demystification. You know, like people of my age and my generation, I started when the Wang computer was a piece of leading edge technology. So you've got to constantly make the technology into context of what it can do to help clients and, and help practice. So I think, you know, one of the other things here around accelerating uh, the uptake is we often talk about this in terms of revolutionizing what we do for clients, not as much what we do for ourselves. And one of the expressions I use here is we can't keep practicing with parchment and quills as lawyers whilst we expect our clients to revolutionize, digitize AI eyes and datafy their own environment. So the profession needs to accelerate its uptake just as much as the profession uh, for itself as it does in, in solving problems for clients. Uh, secondly, I think we just need to invest more. So, you know, there is the classic thing, and I, I love Gilbert saying, you know, you've got to have a longer term view to ROI. There's time investment and capital investment in technology and legal technology, and you don't get it without investing in it. So I think we do need a mindset change of, you know, a, a, an investment in year one that might in fact look quite large for a professional services firm, over the next five to 10 years will actually pay off in terms of client service, client experience, lawyer experience, and the economics in ways you can't really appreciate. So it's a bit of shifting, I think, the short-term um, short mindset that applies a lot of, across a lot of the profession. Uh, thirdly, I think, um, and you alluded to it a bit, Richard, there's um, so many players in the market with point solutions. So in fact, I think at, at one point, there needs to be some form of consolidation in the market or some form of ranking so that users and, and clients can actually better um, navigate their way through those providers. And if that's a tiering, if that's success or failure, or if that's consolidation, I, I just think that's a natural evolution of the, uh, of the tech and the legal tech market. Uh, and fourthly, and, and it's something we do here a lot, and I'm sure um, the other panel does, uh, doing it in alliance and collaboration. So where we find, you know, enormous acceleration of using technology and legal technology isn't trying to create it ourselves or, or just buying a piece. It's actually having an alliance with Thomson Reuters or Syrian Labs or Plexus or Microsoft, which we then partner with to, de to develop solutions. And that sort of collaboration, so it's not just competition, it's actually collaboration as well. And we collaborate with, with organisations like law companies and, and other law firms. I think there's a, a real collaboration piece here for the industry to get its head around so that the solutions develop faster, the client gets served better, and in fact, our lawyer experience is a lot more positive. Thank you. I, I think your demystification point um, is such an important one, and running alongside your observation about the number of players in the market, I think it's easy for those of us who live and breathe legal technology to forget how 
mysterious all of this must sound and look, even our past discussion of AI, uh, I think most people who are actually joining us today are in the camp, as it were. But it always occurs to me, if your surgeon said to you, for example, uh, they don't keep up with the latest technologies, you think, what on earth? Um, yeah. uh, but it, it's quite hard in law, I think, uh, for most very busy practitioners to take this on board. So the demystification point really hit, hit home with me. Uh, James, your experience and observations. Yeah, um, Stuart, I, I think I, I agree with a number of the points that Stuart made. Um, you know, we've faced this sort of Cambrian explosion of legal tech startups, some of them beyond startups now, but, you know, really in the last, I know there's been some that have been around for 20 years, but really in the last sort of five years and, as with um, the phase of any kind of industry's development, you get this this explosion of of ideas and innovation, and then in an inevitable um, degree of consolidation. And I think in this regard, um, what we see that the um, to um, catalyze the uptake of legal technology amongst users, we have to look at what what are the friction points that stop users from using legal technology. Well, one of them is. There's so many companies out there that, you know, you have to evaluate all of these companies and hold it all in your head at the same time. And then guess what? Three of them just went bankrupt because they didn't get Series C funding and, and someone's been bought by someone else and they've, they've, they've binned it. Um, so one of the uh, friction points that uh, we see and that we're trying to solve is how do you reduce or remove that interface between between various legal technologies and, and beyond that with the enterprise systems of an organization. But, you know, APIs um, uh, which connect technologies are brittle things. Somebody changes their tool and suddenly API no longer works. So you've got this dual problem of trying to evaluate new technologies that in a landscape that's constantly changing. And then one, just as you've decided that you, you know, these are your six technologies you want to use and you, and you try and daisy chain them together, um, somebody changes something and the API breaks down and, and, and very soon you, be, you become exhausted with just the whole exercise of it. So um, our um, bet, if you like, is um, that the legal world will experience something similar to what SAP or Oracle drove in the ERP space. Um, SAP, um, many, many modules, you know, many of them aren't great. Like if, if you've used SAP, you know, you kind of have to lump your way through some of them. Um, but you do it because you have these dozen modules all in one system with a common da data architecture at the back and a, a common pool of data, which these various modules within SAP can, can exploit. Um, and there are a few companies, including, including ours, who are working feverishly towards building an enterprise legal and management tool of the mold of, of SAP, because we believe that um, uh, by doing so, it removes this friction of daisy chaining individual technologies and having to select um, technologies in, in, a, in a rapidly changing world. So, so that's kind of one of the ways that we are trying to to um, increase adoption by uh, reducing uh, some sort of interface friction. Great, thank you very much, James. Over to you, Michelle. Huh? Um, you can respond to what you've heard or, or offer your own thoughts on how we might accelerate legal tech. I think at the heart of it, um, the change or the adoption piece is gonna be done by humans. So we have to focus, and James started this, and certainly Stuart spoke to it as well, around um, the barriers, really. And um, I think understanding deeply the barriers for either your organisation or, or the area you work in is a really important place to start because from there you can design your systemic enablers or solutions that actually go to the heart of what's actually preventing this adoption occurring within your organisation or in your firm or uh, your department. So I think really tackling, first of all, that systemic enablement, I think is critical. The second piece is culture change. And I think organisations don't change, people do. And, you know, law is driven by people for people. So I think you need to really get into how do we get the culture change? Uh, we're focused very heavily on what we call beans, which are behaviour enablers, 
artifacts and nudges. And these are ways to get our people to find it really easy to adopt and use. Uh, and there's three behaviours that we think really drive at the heart for lawyers uh, of taking up adoption. And one of that's awareness. And I think attending things like this to the points made previously, mm -hmm. understanding there's various associations that can give you short lists of what tech does, which in which area, which founders are available. There are certainly assets you can do to understand more what's happening around that a lot of great free webinars and things where you can kind of lift that awareness if it can't be cultivated for you. Open-mindedness would be my second one to really focus on. Is there a better way to do this? Curiosity around, can I do it a different way? Uh, and then the third one for us is dare to try. I think we're often really used to being perfectionists and getting it right. The dare to try is critical. And I think where we've tried to unlock that is having peer-to-peer information exchange, storytelling, peer-to-peer -peer learning. We do a lot around reverse mentoring on our legal tech so that we've got our graduates teaching mm. our partners. We've got our graduates running training sessions. We've got the senior associates talking about how the technology is used on the transaction, bringing the two pieces, the legal work and the tech together, rather than seeing as something quite separate. So I think bringing it holistically into context really helps and really driving that awareness. Thank you for that. Uh, people really do, it seems to me as I, I speak to lawyers who, who are less inclined or less interested, they, they do ask a fairly basic question is, uh, I don't know where to begin or where do I begin? It goes back, I think, to James' point. In a way, we're becoming increasingly spoiled for choice uh, because a lot of the discussions about legal tech operate at quite a low level, at the level of systems and solutions. Uh, and uh, uh, my own inclination is to encourage more top-down thinking to understand which parts of your business are affected and then ask what kind of solutions and systems might be available. Because if you're just confronted with the 5,000 possible solutions out there, you really don't know where to start. Anna, from a, from a GC's point of view. Uh, two things. One, I think uh, innovation needs to be core, so it needs to be a priority. And that means KPIs, that means discussions in team meetings, in WIPs, uh, it just needs to be on, on the agenda. So innovation needs to be on the agenda and quite high on the agenda to drive it home. And that's top down, down, you know, down up, everyone in the legal team uh, uh, to incentivize that change within um, and to change the mindset. And I think that then feeds into, in the same way that we've been, you know, we're living in an era of putting gender on the tender. I think we need to put innovation on the tender um, so, you know, clients are adept at uh, making sure that that is a, one of the top criteria in terms of selecting their extended legal panel. And I think innovation needs to join, uh, you know, join that, that charge to, to really drive change. So that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, just to expand a little bit on, on some of the threads that have already been uh, raised, which is education. Uh, we're struggling you know, at the senior end and we've got access and we've got connections and networks and contacts. Um, the, the generations before us are also struggling because they're reading about this in the press, but they're not being given access to it and they don't have the same uh, level of accessibility that we do once we're in roles and organisations um, that may or may not have innovation as a value. So I think there needs to be some work done and it's a huge leadership piece around how do we educate the next generation so they don't feel daunted and again we're not we're not uh, replicating the fear we're actually allaying the fear and stepping up and making them feel really ready uh, to walk in and understand what innovation means what does technology means and the other point about education is i think we need to share more because a lot of us are innovating, but a lot of us are shy on social media. And it's very difficult to understand which law firms are innovating and what they're doing. Uh, what are in-house teams doing? Um, it shouldn't necessarily take a conference, you know, where, where it's so formally discussed. I think if we try and normalize it as a day-to-day -day behavior and an attitude and a daily practice, and we talk about it, uh, in a way that's visible to everybody in our networks, then again, it's bringing it to the top of the agenda. It's normalising it. It's taking the fear out of it. And to Stuart's point, it is demystifying, not on a one-to-one -one basis or a within-organisation basis, but on a one-to-many basis.
Thank you. I find the education point so compelling or so worrying as well, in fact, uh, and it goes right back to law schools. Uh, I think I worry that our law schools are, not all of them, but many are still generating 20th century lawyers rather than 21st century lawyers, really not asking the question, what are we training our young lawyers to become? Because wh whatever view of AI or whatever view of technology one embraces, it's a very different legal profession and legal uh, industry than say 20 years ago. So I think that's a point very well made. And I, thank you. Uh, Gilbert, I noticed you had your hand up, uh, but uh, you now have the floor. You can put your hand down. Yeah, I, I was just gonna add a point to what uh, Michelle had said earlier on. I think that um, you need to manage the expectations. And I, I find that in the implementation of technology in my firm, um, you know, a lot of people have a lot of expectations. And, and if you do not manage that piece well, then I think you may be setting yourself to fail because the people will think that technology is the holy grail, right? Once we have it, all our problems will be solved, but they don't quite realize that you know, it's actually an incremental process. So that, that educational bit is important, but an education to say as well that, we are not afraid to fail and we'll learn along the way. And, you know, and that's why it is a journey, you know, it, uh, technology and implementation of it is a journey. That education piece is important. We find that our younger lawyers are clearly more adept to technology. Um, but the older lawyers as well, I think um, they are beginning to see the benefits of it. They too have young children and they're going to see the um, uh, technology in their kids' lives. Um, and the key is do not fear, right? Um, we will change and uh, we'll be able to adapt. I, I think that really is a key message in any implementation of technology. Thank you very much. James, you have a question or an observation? Yeah, um, I guess my observation, um, as, so as a company, we have to flog this stuff. You know, we've got legal technology in our toolbox, which we're trying to sell to the market. And so it is, it is lifeblood for us to be able to sniff out who's, who's a buyer and who's not, because you don't want to waste your time with people who aren't going to buy it and implement it and what have you. And, and so the observations from, from that journey, um, I think, um, a key one is that building on what Michelle said, it is change is very individualistic. You know, there are some, there are some progressive law firms and corporate legal departments out there. Um, but if the individual is not progressive, it's going to go nowhere. Likewise, you could have some quite um, conservative organizations with some you know, firebrand director or partner, what have you, who is just willing to do something different. Um, and so that leads on to, I think, a key responsibility of business leaders, which is, yes, to build a culture um, that embraces change, but to be brutal about it, to make sure that you've got the right people on the bus, people who are willing to change. And if they, and, and yes, I, I believe in human nature that people can become more embracing of change. But for the most part, you know, we are kind of set in our ways in terms of our orientation towards adopting new things. And um, the most effective organizations I've, I've seen have, from a people management perspective, um, carefully, consistently moved on people who just want to turn the handle and replace them with people who are more embracing of change. And I think that's absolutely critical as business leaders that we make sure that we have the right people on the bus. Well, thank you for that. It, to some extent, that echoes something that Gilbert was saying about, uh, and I think others have said too, about leadership. Um, that traditionally, if you think over the last 25, 30 years of the profession, uh, next year has looked pretty much like last year um, and, and we've evolved. But I think we're seeing ourselves at a time now of discontinuity and it's harder to be collegiate. It's harder to take everyone with you with technology. And I think it's misconceived personally for leaders within firms to delay getting on the technology bus until everyone's prepared to, to jump on. Uh, I think you lead by example. Uh, I think uh, you lead by inspiring. I think you lead uh, according to the market's preferences. But uh, I think this single subject could bring about a change in the style of management and leadership you see in law firm. It's very hard to be consensual on the issue of technology because for all the evangelists and believers you have, you've always got atheists and agnostics too. Stuart, yes. So Richard, so, so lawyers are competitive people, right? There's a uh, 
unifying theme around the human bit of lawyers is lawyers hate to lose. So what, what I found is what makes a huge difference in KPMG is if we win uh, an engagement where our technology is a differentiator as part of the legal service we provide, it massively changes people's view of the value of technology. So if a client says, we've chosen you not only because of your legal strength, blah, 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 but the tech solution you had. Uh, equally, we've had situations where we've lost engagements because our tech solution has not been as good as our competitors, whether it's law firms or the other big four. Incredibly motivating factor for lawyers who might be doubters about tech to lose something to a competitor on the basis of a tech solution. Uh, so I think we've got to kind of go back to the nature of the beast, which is very competitive, never like to lose. Uh, but that does take leadership about being very transparent about what, why has the client chosen us? Have they chosen us because we're great lawyers or it's a combination of a lawyer plus a service plus technology? And what are the differentiators? I think, James, you were kind of alluding to that. It's a, there's a combination of things, but unless you are quite clear about what, what differentiates you and what the client uses to differentiate you, you can't motivate the team as well. Stuart, there's another point that comes out from what you were saying there that, in, in a way, evidence for lawyers is more convincing than argument. That's to say, when you deliver evidence of success, uh, that takes people with you. I found with lawyers, for every argument, there's a counter-argument. Uh, and so arguing or discussing the relative merits of technologies or non-technologies is far less fruitful than saying, here's actually the benefits is delivered for us. Um, <laughs> Michelle, your hands up. I was, I was going to agree with Stuart on that. I think the winning workpiece is a really critical uh, element here. And I think people who... Uh, have used technology uh, and then have a story to tell about, I got more clients, I got a bigger piece of work, I got, you know, clients that I thought I couldn't service previously and technology has allowed me to scale that offering. I think those stories are hugely moving, especially if they're from people who are not really technology proponents. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can get your visibility within your organisations for those people to speak up and share their stories and make it very visible, it makes a huge world of difference. Um, and I think the winning work piece is pretty anchored. But the other one I would say that comes up really strongly is our graduates talking about the way they work. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, people will find that really an interesting story to capture, which is they're often suggesting new ways of working uh, and having people saying, how, how do we do that? And you'll, you'll see that happening because they're the power base, where they fit into the organisation, what they know, they can actually have that effect as well. So I think they're almost, well, for us, certainly our graduates are often legal tech natives because they, you know, from day one, they're kind of using it and we're encouraging them to do so. So I think that piece is also shifting. Thank you. I'm conscious I've had half an eye to the, the chat, uh, conscious that there's lots of questions come through. So let's bring Francis back in, who's hopefully been curating them for us. Francis. Ah, well, my document has got extra large with the questions going through chat and trying to monitor it. So uh, thank you, everybody. And we'll do our best to try and um, get through them. So um, I have... Um, so, Marie, uh, Marina, I, I see you've got quite a lot of questions there, so um, I will pick and choose some of them. So my apologies. I know that um, you put, uh, posed a lot. But if we start with the first one from Anders, um, this is to everybody. And uh, um, So in the Nordic countries, lawyers like to talk about legal tech but prefer not to do anything. Even though they would, like, uh, they would streamline their business considerably, the reason is they often lack the authority to make decisions about implementation of legal tech tools. Any tips? Um, of how to get around this problem. That sounds to me to be one for Gilbert. Gilbert, you must let him read this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've heard Anna mention earlier on that it needs to be top down, and that was exactly the approach that we took um, in, in our firm, right? Um, get get buy-in amongst a few key partners and get the management community of the firm uh, to stand behind um, uh, technology and the implementation of it. Um, in my firm, I, I'm nicknamed Oliver, right? Because I keep on going to my partners with a begging board to say, please, sir, may I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I need more money all the time. And um, uh, But I've got very patient partners um, who believe in the value of technology. So it's a bit like a, being a, an evangelist 
um, you need those in the firm. You need people who would follow. You need, uh, you, but you do need to show a good business case for for the use of technology. So, whilst the individual lawyers may not uh, necessarily be able to to show for it or to do um, uh, or to implement the technology, uh, go make sure that you put on a good business case. Uh, you know, like what Stuart has said, some other law firm has, is beating us because they're using better, better technology. Uh, set a little bit of a modest budget, do small projects to try out, get buy-in, and then change the culture from there. I mean, um, it's not an easy journey. Um, it is not a short journey either, uh, but uh, keep at it and uh, you will get there. Well, there's no end to the journey in a way. There's no end to the journey. Yeah, absolutely right. So I, you know, from from an amateur beggar, I have become a professional beggar. So, <laughs> what I'm going to suggest, because there's so many questions, is that we maybe just have one person answering each question. So otherwise, we're not going to do justice. So if you'll leave it to my, and you're giving me a huge discretion here, just to pick a person, then we can get through as many as we can in the in the the 10 minutes we have left. Francis, you right. got to uh, We've got the next one, Richard, thank you, um, from Ashwini. Um, so legal councils want to go with implementing technology and process improvement, but sometimes they're not able to make quick decisions with technology. The delay, uh, they delay the process. Why is this so? James, I saw you nodding your head, which I took to be a yellow hand. Uh, yeah, so, so um, Again, as someone who has sort of become a, somebody of a connoisseur of trying to flog this stuff uh, to uh, legal counsel and in-house teams, uh, again, it's an imperative for us to actually get it implemented. So what I've learned over the years is that um, indeed lawyers don't like buying technology. Uh, and indeed, once you go down the rabbit hole of building a business case to implement a certain bit of technology. Someone, someone questions it and it goes to a board and someone votes on it and, uh, and then six months have passed and, uh, and the use case has died. And, and you know, it, it's very, very tough. So the approach that we find far more successful, uh, and this is specific to, to legal, corporate legal departments, is corporate legal departments are used to buying services from law firms. They buy services all the time. That's, that what they, that's what they do. And they can, they can buy eye-wateringly expensive amounts of services, millions of dollars on matters, um, and it, get, it just gets passed through the powers that be in a relatively simple fashion. So um, what, where we have found more success uh, um, uh, is in delivering tech-enabled services. So, for example, delivering contract services, which is a human being perhaps sitting in our Delhi facility. But guess what? Included in that is a piece of workflow technology that we just switch on. Now, we're kind of charging for that um, within, the, within the overall headline fee, but I'm not having to go to the company and say, hey, can you subscribe to a bit of workflow tech so that I can streamline my provision of contract services from India, please? It will provide you with contract services. And by the way, here's a, a bit of free workflow technology. And that sidesteps a lot of the... Um, um, sort of the knee-jerk reaction that you can get amongst buyers. Oh, it's a bit of tech. Therefore, it goes down this channel. And, and that channel is long and convoluted and often ends in death. Great, thank you. I'm going to stop you there. Um, I know there's a lot of questions about my bookcase. Yes, the books are genuine. Uh, I single-handedly <laughs> keep Amazon in business. Francis, next question. <laughs> Um, and this is from an anonymous, um, this is from an anonymous um, listener. Um, how do we make sure we change the industry to be welcoming of new lawyers with disabilities and illnesses? Can we implement new technologies to aid in productivity for those lawyers who may not be able to work traditional hours? So interesting question, slightly different. That's such an important question as well. Michelle, you're looking uh, pensive on that one. Can I hand it over to you? I was thinking about, I was just thinking uh, uh, about that in that uh, there's quite a number of technologies um, that do have audio. I'm not sure around the specifics of the question around uh, what disabilities you're referring, but uh, if we just talk about, um, I think there is audio, there is visual assistance, there are a number of technologies I think are getting quite good in that regard. Uh, certainly speech to text is certainly better. We've been using and playing with transcription of notes of meetings, so real-time transcription and pulling it back using audio. Uh, so I think that piece is helping. It's not the answer, but I think there are some pieces there. On the wellness piece, 
Um, I think there's certainly a lot more work to be done. I think many of us have focused on trying to find um, areas of work that are very laborious and time intensive and see if we can reduce them using tech to get our people out and to help on that front. Uh, but I think a partial answer, I don't think there's a great single answer to that one. I think we've we a lot more work to do in that area, really. Francis, other questions? Yes, so this is from Malcolm Heath. Um, now, um, so, so from a small firm, um, so a small firm question, um, in the sense of, uh, for an answer, I should say, the vast, uh, vast majority of law firms in Australia are small practices. Um, revenues of sub um, $400,000, he was saying. I think, I think that's correct. Um, they are small businesses of, of sole practitioner or one to two partner solicitor director firms. There seems to be an accelerating divide between the large IT sophisticated law firm with capabilities to invest in tech and the small firm with limited capital reserves, some with poor IT knowledge and skills. How do you see the small firm surviving in five to 10 years time? What advice would you give the small law firm owner? Well, Stuart, you're doing the, the fatal thing of nodding there, which uh, means <laughs> you're now eligible, indeed ideal, to respond to that question. Now, I know you come from a very different size of organisation, but you think deeply about management issues. So what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I was actually wondering whether it's a Malcolm Heath that I know, Richard, as well. But anyway, um, no, look, I, I, think, um, I think it's already been touched on. I think uh, James mentioned around sort of enterprise solutions or platforms and aggregators that are being developed. And um, Michelle referred to the work Microsoft is doing to embed tech into Office 365. I think in a strange way, the market is going to help solve this problem for smaller firms because you will actually buy, you know, an enterprise system, which is Office 365, and it will have embedded in it the technology or you'll get something from Elevate or from KPMG or KWM, which will actually help solve that. Um, and I think it comes to the collaboration piece. I, I think, you know, if, if we continually put clients at the centre of what we do, then collaboration actually needs to become a little stronger around this. I think it's also <laughs> true, true to say that smaller organisations genuinely can be more nimble, can make decisions more quickly, can bring about fairly fundamental organisational change over a weekend. And so you, you yep. don't suffer from super tanker syndrome. Uh, Gilbert, yep. you have an observation in this one. Yeah, I, I think that um, firms should also look outside of their own countries for solutions. Because, you know, with the advent of cloud technology and you could actually buy services from somebody outside of your home country that is actually suitable for you at a price point that may also be suitable for you, right? So you could club together to, to, to buy the technology. You could actually use cloud services as based outside the country. Don't limit yourself just to solutions that's within the country. Um, you may be able to find things that uh, are, are suitable for a small boutique uh, sole practitioner type of uh, uh, practice. Thank you. Francis, I think we've probably got time for one more question, and I think Anna is going to answer it just in terms of uh, <laughs> in terms of fair distribution across the panel. Uh, I, I do think we should close on time, and uh, it's such a shame that we can't address all the issues raised, but it's just an indication, I think, to all of us how live and lively the legal tech conversation is. And an indication to you, Francis, that you've got to convene more of these meetings. I know, I do, I do. It's now fitting it into the calendar. Like everybody else, Zoom is just like, they're on the button. So it's like... <laughs> okay, so final question. I've got, if it's possible to, because one's about code on drafting, which I'd like to bring in. So I think this is a really interesting point. But there is one here, which um, obviously, um, this is coming from Ankur. Um, Gupta, is there any compilation of use cases which what worked, what needed improvement of legal tech in law firms, in-house functions, which panelists can share here? So, Anna, do you want to respond to that from the point of view GC in terms of, because uh, you've written about this yourself, of course, uh, in, in your own book. Uh, it, it, it's full of use cases, as it were. But uh, how would you like to respond? So I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there any compilation of use cases? What worked of legal tech in law firms in-house, which panellists can share? So, uh, Ankur, do you want an example? Uh, just, so, just so I answer that question properly. Yes, uh, well, I think it's looking for examples of what worked from your perspective in the in-house. So if you look in the in-house team, what worked for you with regards to sort of um, 
um, legal tech for some of the roles. I think he's looking for some advice on that. Um, I don't know if, he, if he's still with us at the moment, but that was the question which he asked. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that clarification. So I think the key thing is, uh, and, you know, and the, the concepts that we've touched on before, it's starting small and thinking big. The first bit of technology that we rolled out in my last role was business facing. It didn't help, it helped the lawyers as a secondary byproduct. But what it did is removed pain point, removed the manual uh, nature of um, the agreement, and also removed the friction between the company and the third party to make it a more digitized experience and therefore aligned with the business objective of digitizing the industry. Um, so I think that that's, that's really an important tip. If you're in-house, make sure that your first bit of technology is going to affect your end users rather than your legal users, because the legal users will get the ancillary benefit but if you can get in your first bit of technology a business case and then champions because they love it so much, it's then so much easier to roll out more technology, get funding, get the engagement. And almost the legal team doesn't need to become the champions anymore because the business become, you know, the users become the champions. So I think that's, that's probably the um, kind of a, a conceptual answer to that question without getting really specific. Mm. Um, if I may, Richard, there's one about code, which I'd be really, I think is really important in this current environment, um, especially where we're moving in terms of technology from uh, Marina. Please reflect, reflect on the rules of code movement. Um, how will this impact legislative drafting, contract drafting in the future? Why do I ever go there then? Um, if, unless uh, anyone would like to raise their, their yellow hand in that. I mean, there's there's many aspects to the law's code movement. One is just this idea that so many of the systems we use have, le have laws that were embedded in them. And so the way we are able or unable to use various facilities are determined uh, less directly by formal legislation or regulation and more embedded in the code themselves. And that's fundamental, I think, as our, our lives become increasingly dominated by technology, we'll find ourselves restricted in what we're able to do and what we're encouraged to do by the technologies we use. And so that's, that's a whole set of fascinating issues and dates back to Larry Lessig's work in Harvard some years ago. Uh, the second question about the extent to which we can uh, codify the law as it were in code or write legislation in code um, is a profound one. And again, actually, I mean, the work in this began in the 70s. Uh, I think people talk, in my view, too glibly uh, about doing this because I think it's fundamentally very difficult. Uh, if the task is translating nat natural language into code, going in that direction, it's very hard indeed, because natural language we know is not code. Uh, and so the answer has to be to come in the other direction. But what uh, I think we all find attractive is the idea of being able to write regulations in a way that are directly executable. Um, and I, I think we have to think deeply about how we go about uh, what kind of intellectual activity it is that involves that coding itself is very demanding. Uh, in the work of Lehman Allen in the 60s and 70s, for example, we identified that the, in coding terms, the word unless had, I think, 63 different uh, possible meanings. And, and so this is why I say it, it's not trivial um, trying to codify human language in, in code. Uh, and so we have to come at it from the other direction. But that's a conference in itself. Marina, as I would expect, a great question from you. Uh, Francis, I think we should call it a day. So from my point of view, Anna Stewart, Michelle, Gilbert, James, thank you very much for contributing. And Francis, thank you for convening us. And thank you for everyone for joining us and for listening. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe. And um, again, we look forward to welcoming you for another uh, Legal Tech Talk. So thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.